Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, we have been going through some of the prophecies, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, we had a Prophecy Watchers conference uh, basically two weeks ago, and we didn't do a live stream on Monday the Monday we got back, but what we didn't realize is uh, until basically Friday morning is that the war had started in Israel. So um, I know most of you have been watching that, seeing what's going on. Uh, this may or may not be part of the Bible prophecy, but it certainly looks like it fits. And we'll have to wait and see what actually happens to know for sure if it was or wasn't. Two years ago, there was a skirmish with uh, um, Lebanon. And I talked about Obadiah chapter or Obadiah and um, how it could actually take place. And uh, Netanyahu had said, we're going to do this, but then the war kind of ended. He got replaced by someone else and nothing actually happened. Uh, the same situation is here now. So it's looking, uh, much more likely. So that Tuesday we did a study on Hamas, the Hamas prophecies in scripture. And then a few days later, I think it was Saturday morning or whenever we went ahead and did one on uh, Lebanon, the Obadiah prophecy about Israel taking and, and holding southern Lebanon and the border actually being listed or uh, shown in um, Obadiah. But today I wanted to look at Iran because all of these are kind of connected, or at least the, the nations are forming almost like an allied axis type situation where you've got uh, Iran and uh, Hezbollah and um, uh, well, actually several of the Arab nations. What's interesting this time around is that there are several Arab nations that are either trying to remain neutral or coming right out and saying, this is crazy. I mean, no matter what religion you are, you shouldn't be killing people. So it has to stop. So that's pretty interesting. Um, when we get to the Gog Magog invasion, we'll see that Saudi Arabia is on Israel's side. And there's lots of interesting things to look at it. So I want to start off by looking at, and this should be a short study, but I imagine we may have a lot of questions. So we always have a Q&A on Monday nights. But we just want to do a short study on Iran, a couple of specific prophecies, one out of Jeremiah 49 and one out of Enoch chapter 56. And I believe these go together. Again, it may or may not be exactly what's happening or will possibly could happen in the next week or two but it might be. So before we start, we want to look at some of the ancient history just real quick. And here is a chart of um, ancient Elam. Now, Elam was uh, one of the kids of Shem. So there's Elam, there's Arphaxad, uh, or not Arphaxad, but um, uh, Asher, things like that. So we get the Assyrians, the Elamites, things like that. So this area right here, which is the coastline of modern day Iran, not the mountains, but just the coastline used to be ancient Elam. Now, up in the mountains in the other part of that territory used to be what's called Persia. Okay, and so Persia's had an interesting history on and off with prophecy throughout the centuries. But basically today, with everything reformed, we have the country of Iran. And Iran is basically those two pieces put together. So if we have an end time prophecy about Persia, it would be Iran. If we have an end time prophecy about Elam, it would also be Iran or Iran. So some of these things break up in, in differently. So just to let you know, so we're first going to look at um, Jeremiah chapter 49, which is a prophecy about Elam. Now, the question is always asked when you look at the prophecies in uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and uh, Isaiah. They'll, they'll have short prophecies, one about uh, Elam and uh, Edom and Moab and Ammon and Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and things like that. And you look at those and a lot of times we look at those and say, well, that was all finished, you know, thousands of years ago. So in other words, they were evil to Israel and God punished them, punished Israel. In some cases, that's true. It'll mention Nebuchadnezzar or whomever. And so, you know, we are talking about that. But the whole concept in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that 
uh, prophecy is secular or, or it go, goes in cycles. So if, for instance, uh, we're talking about something that happened and um, the, the country was obliterated or whatever, there was a war, we can look at it. And if we can find that war, then maybe it was just talking about back then. But if there's something to the description that didn't happen back then, then that's not the war we're talking about. And there, there might be multiple wars through the centuries on that one piece of land. So that's the thing we want to look at. So Elam is this power. Now notice here with the current map, Iran is Persia and Elam put together. Elam is the coastland. Along the coast is the uh, Bashur nuclear plant. And I just think that's interesting. We don't want any nuclear disasters. But if there was an earthquake or an attack or something like that, that could uh, definitely cause some problems. It would basically cause everything to be irradiated for who knows how long. And everybody would have to leave there and possibly even go to other countries. So with this in mind, I want to look at a couple of things. So here is, uh, and I'm just using the King James Version, but this is Jeremiah 49. It's just five verses. It's verses 34 to 39. It's the judgment of Elam. So in chapter 49, we have had a judgment also on Kedar and Hazor, Damascus, and Edom, and Ammon. So it's pretty interesting in that area. All of these may or may not be uh, focused on end time prophecy. Uh, or the other stuff, the ancient stuff, or both. So we don't know for sure. We just have to take each one uh, separately. So this last one here, when we talk about Elam, it basically says, and we'll just start off in verse 30, 34. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of, Hez of Zedekiah, rather, king of Judah. Now, to me, this is interesting. Uh, a lot of people today say, just like Peter described, they would. Everything has always been like it's always been. And you guys have always been talking about a rapture or a uh, second coming or Iran and Israel attacking and all this kind of stuff based on this. And it's almost happened over and over and over again. So. It's, it's not going to happen. And even some of us will look at this, this stuff and say, eh, it's another skirmish. You know, I even get to the point where I look at this and say, it's another thing that's going to happen, but probably not yet. I mean, how many times do we go through this in the news every day? Um, but what I think is interesting, take that back to, to um, Jeremiah's day. Now, at this point, it's in the reign, the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah. So as far as Jeremiah is concerned, Israel's Israel, the laws of Israel are the laws of Israel. As far as he knows, even back before he was born, it's always been the same. Nothing's ever changed. There's been warnings through, through the prophets about if you don't do this, things will happen. Or even in a couple of generations, uh, things like that. But nothing ever happens. All of a sudden now what's going to happen is the king of Babylon is going to march in capture Zedekiah, uh, basically blind him, take him away captive, slay his sons in front of him, and then blind him. Um, going to take the ma vast majority of people. He's going to destroy the temple. Jerem uh, the, the, the patriots of that day are going to try to rise up and attack Babylon, the Babylonian troops. Jeremiah is going to say, under the circumstances, I mean, normally we would always defend our country, but this is a judgment of God, stand down. They're going to get mad at him and almost kill him, but they're going to throw him in a pit, a prison, for a good amount of time. So I bring all that back up because Jeremiah, at this point, at the beginning, beginning of the reign of Hezekiah, nothing's happened. Everything's always happened, just like it always happens, you know. Nothing's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's no country. There's no king. He watched the destruction as prophesied. And because he tried to stand up for what's right, he's now in a prison cell. You know, temporarily, but still, things can happen very, very quickly. And that's what we learned a few weeks back. A war could start, uh, an invasion of a border, unbeknownst to you at any time. 
Yes, decades and decades and decades go by without wars like that. But things happen. So this is the beginning of this. And then he's got these prophecies. The word of the Lord comes to him. And I want to remind you that uh, the word of the Lord is an idiom. And we're talking about the father making the entire creation through his word. And John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In verse 14, it says, he became flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So the word of the Lord is actually a Christophany. We've got to remind you of that. So here is the pre-incarnate Christ coming to a prophet. He's not thinking up something out of the imagination of his heart as the false prophets do. So the word of the Lord actually comes to him and says, I have this prophecy to give you, write it down. And it's in the beginning of the reign of Hezekiah. So thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. Now the bow, of course, is the, the, uh, the, the army or the uh, terrorist group or the government structure, whatever is oppressing the people at that time. And if we're talking about back then, I don't know which one it was. Maybe it was all of those. But the basic government structure, military, police, whatever. Uh, the bow of Elam, the chief of their might, will be broken. Upon Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no nation where the outcasts of Elam shall not come or go. So basically something happens at a certain time and the people of Elam, not necessarily Iran or Persia up in the mountains, but the people of Elam scatter. Some disaster happens when the, when the bow is broken. And I don't know if you wanted to put this in modern terms, the, the bow of Elam, the chief of their might, might be nuclear weapons. And if that's broken, that would cause a nuclear disaster. Just speculating on my part, but something happens. Uh, I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, before them that seek their life. So there is an enemy to Elam that tries to kill them. And they're dismayed before them. I will bring evil upon them. Even my fierce anger, says the Lord. And I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Now, again, we're talking about uh, the bow or the chief of their might. So we're not talking about the Iranian people or the Elamite people or the Persian people in general, at least way back when anyway. And sometimes today, the people didn't have uh, much say in the government. So whatever happens, happens. Uh, and so people, innocent women and children are not the target. It's the the government, the terrorist groups, the army, whoever's making a war against someone else. But he sends a sword after them, which is uh, another group of people. And it's pretty interesting just to see this whole concept. Um, so going back at verse 36, there's no nation where the outcasts of Elam shall not come. So here in America, there will be refugees from there. Um, and I know people have said that this happened a long time ago. Maybe it did. Maybe it's happening again. Um, being scattered to the four winds or from the four winds basically is an idiom just meaning over the whole world. Uh, the church fathers talked about when Israel returns from the north. That's 537 BC under Cyrus. When they return from the four corners of the earth or from the uh, four winds of the earth or from all nations. It's basically talking about not that time, but the return from the Roman expulsion, which is 1948 AD, of which the date was actually prophesied. So uh, going on, he sends a sword after them until I have consumed them. This kind of reminds me of in the Gog Magog War towards the end of chapter 38. And I don't believe this, even if this is happening now, or will happen in the future is the same thing as the Gog Magog War. And I'll show you why in a little bit. But 
in that Gog Magog war, you have God sending confusion to the enemy. God does this a lot all the way through the Old Testament. There are times when uh, two different nations would attack Israel, or maybe it's even the same nation, but he would ha take half of the people and make them think somehow, confuse them, that the other half of the people are Israel. And these people think the other half of the people are Israel. And the nation basically turns on itself and they attack and destroy themselves. There's even one time in the Old Testament where the Lord spoke through the prophet, said, at this point, I'm going to do something. You're about ready to be wiped out. I want you to put your weapons, your swords, and your shields down. I want you to take bags, go out in the battlefield, and just sit down on the hill and watch the show. And the enemy comes up, and the Lord sows confusion. They attack and kill each other. And then the Lord says, now pick up, go pick up the spoils, go home and have a party. And, and the one th thing that you get from this absolutely is that we had nothing to do with this victory. This is all the Lord's doing. It has to be because none of us did anything. So, but you see that a lot, this whole concept of, of uh, sending um, that kind of stuff. One of the things I'd always speculated is if this is end time prophecy and Iran is building nuclear missiles, and they decide at one point, maybe say they have some missiles nobody knows about, and they decide to launch their missiles at Israel and they push the button. What happens if there's a legitimate malfunction or a virus, for instance, that simply says don't open the bay doors and those nuclear weapons explode in the silos before they even completely launch? Something like that might happen. That would cause Elam to be uninhabitable. So lots of things could happen. So, okay. Going on there, it says, And then I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from thence the king and the princes, says the Lord. So I will set my throne. That could either be that it's going to become a Christian nation um, or that his throne, his throne could be an idiom for Israel, I will set my throne in Elam to destroy the king and the princes. And so that could be talking about a, uh, a war. And so this sword that he sends after them actually might be the Israeli army. You never know. Could be something like that. But somehow the throne of the Lord ends up being in Elam or Persia or Elam, Persia com combined Iran. So this particular prophecy is on the hearts and minds of a lot of Christians in Iran. And they actually believe that this is being fulfilled in a couple of different ways. And let's look at this last verse. It shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elam, says the Lord. Now, we always look at this term latter days or end times. And we think of it's time when the Antichrist comes. And But if we stop and think about it, we know when the Antichrist comes, it's not the la the end times per se, the, the exact end. Because he gets destroyed and there's a millennial reign, a thousand years. So what do we mean by latter days or last times or whatever? If it says something about their latter days, that's probably when that nation is destroyed. And that could be any time. But when it says the latter days or the end times, we're talking about the end of an age. And on the Jewish calendar, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, there are three ages and then a millennial reign. So this could be talking about in Jeremiah's time, it's going to be future. So the latter days is going to be around the time of the first coming. It's before 75 AD. And there was nothing like this that happened, as far as I know, recorded. Uh, with Elam or Iran or Persia in those days. So that means it falls in the latter days or towards the end of uh, the Age of Grace, uh, which is from 25 AD to, or 2025 to 2075. So that last generation or that last uh, jubilee period of our age or our, oh no, 
Um, so it shall come to pass in the latter days that this kind of stuff happens. I was talking a few weeks ago with a pastor that is Iranian, but he pastors a church in Istanbul, Turkey. And so, but he keeps in contact with his friends and his family and that kind of thing. And they, we were talking about this and I wanted to know his take or the Iranian people's take on this particular uh, prophecy. Because the way I read it is like in the near future, there will be a nuclear disaster or something and people will scatter and they'll clean it up. And then at a certain time, the outcasts will come back. And he looked at it a little bit differently. He said, well, that, you know, it's a possibility. But the way they look about it is that Elam is Elam. It's just a country, decent country. People are great. Friends with Israel, always been fine. Up until the 70s when the Shah of Iran was deposed and the um, Islamic government was set up and started basically trying to force Sharia law on everyone. Women have to wear burqas and all this kind of stuff. And the really bad part of their history comes. So some were executed, some of them fled. And so their take or his take on this prophecy is that that part has already happened. And now when the fall of the regime happens, it will become a basically a Christian nation. And there's apparently a large group of underground, the underground church there now, and they're looking forward to this. So they're thinking that part has already happened. And in the near future, when the current government is toppled and becomes a godly nation, the exiles will return. So that was kind of interesting. It's like the way I'm looking at it, it could make it many, many decades in the future before this is fixed. And the way he's looking at it is, you know, basically later this year, it could be fixed. So we'll see what happens. Some of the other things people have talked about is maybe this is the Gog Magog War, or maybe this is the war. So let me let me go on with this. This is where most people end and say there's going to be some judgment, some sort of a war between Israel and Elam, or Israel and Iran, and it's based on this passage. And I believe that to be correct. But let me fill in some of the gaps. And the way we fill in the gaps, again, Elam is the coastland, Persia is the high mountain area, together they form Iran. But there is another prophecy about this war, and again, this may be the one beginning to happen, or it may not be, but just something to know about. In the ancient book of Enoch, we talk about a lot of things. Enoch gives you a basic view of morality in the last generation, it says, where that tribulation occurs. So that last generation technically starts in two years, or actually a year and a half, but whatever. Maybe we're off a few years. So, but right about now, things should be setting up for this major time period. But it talks about that in the first uh, 16 chapters or so, or six chapters, something like that. And then the next uh, 15 or 20 chapters, it talks about Nephilim history. So it gives us a lot of details, and there's a lot more details of Nephilim history, of uh, genetic research, tampering, very specific things that they did back then, and how it went further post-flood. So all that is, is there, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, church fathers mention it, other rabbis mention it, etc. But then the other part of it is some parables, and then there's some end-time prophecies. Uh, some of which deal with the, their latter days, and some of them are very specific to our latter days, like the shepherd prophecy uh, and then several others that are in there. In this particular place, this is chapter 56. The book of Enoch, as we know it from the Ethiopic, has 107 chapters. It may be tampered with or not necessarily tampered with, but added to. There's a couple places in there that really looks like, you know, you're following a train of thought. We cut to something else, come right back and go in like somebody inserted something. And it sounds kind of Gnostic, doesn't really teach anything. So it just kind of sounds like something else got in there. Uh, we'll know when we find an actual Hebrew copy of the full book of Enoch. There are rumored to be an Aramaic copy somewhere in private hands. So... We would love to get a hold of that, but 
um, the chapters that we have, a good amount of the chapters from the Dead Sea Scrolls agree with the Ethiopic, um, ex for the exception of some of the numbers. So anyway, in this chapter, it talks about the fallen angels being imprisoned. This is at the end of the Nephilim type stuff. <clears throat> and what's interesting to me is this is brought up because the fallen angels have a bearing, small bearing, small part to play on a war with Iran and Israel. And that's something we don't think about. We think about the whole idea of it's just, you know, some evil guy in this country and some guy in this country and they don't get along and they attack each other. Um, we we'll go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel talks about the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece having wars. And the way he talks about it, it's like there are supernatural powers making the king, you know, attack. And the, the, the army obeys the king. The king is confused and controlled by a demonic spirit. And so the, really the power behind it is angelic or demonic or something like that. So we have that precedent in scripture. Not to go too far with it, but the fallen angels are chained up. And even in Revelation, we have the four angels chained under the Euphrates. Um, and we have Azazel ch chained over under Beth Hadudo. And there's, so there's several places in Israel and in other places where there are fallen angels that are chained. And that's just a handful. There's quite a few. Um, and so they're, they're in prison. And so this is talking about that particular thing. And then we get to this prophet prophecy here. So in this particular version, it's chapter 56, verse 5. So starting in verse 5, it says, In those days, and we don't know what days we're talking about There's when this war happens, whenever that is, but in those days, the angels will return and come to the kings of the east. Now, again, kings of the east, I always think of, of Persia. and it, Today, I would think of China, you know, the far east, that kind of thing. That may or may not even be a thought in their mind, but east of some sort. Along with the Medes and the Persians. Now, at first thought, you might look at this and think, okay, Medes and Persians. When the Medes and Persians were together, that's Cyrus with Darius, okay? Uh, but again, this is going to talk about, this is a prophecy of the end times or the latter days. So again, it has to be either a prophecy of them attacking around 537 BC, which is not exactly what happened, uh, or attacking in some form about now, which is not Cyrus, but some other group, but Medes and Persians. So this is a group of people generally called the kings of the east. So there may be a lot of little states out east that go along with the Medes and the Persians. And the Persians, I think, are the main thing that we want to talk about. So Elam and Persia today are Iran. So when we mention Persia, we're talking about Iran. So in these days, the angels will return. Some angel that's been chained up for thousands of years are loosed to do something. And this is not connected with the four angels under the Euphrates. Because the entire book of Revelation is talking about that seven-year period prior to the second coming of our Lord. So even if it's on the horizon, first we have to have the rapture. And you and I are still here, so there's been no rapture yet. And after the rapture, all those things in Revelation occur. So those four angels have not been loosed, but somebody somewhere has been loosed when this event occurs. So it says, um, the angels return and come to the kings of the east along with the Medes and the Persians, okay, meaning Iran. They will stir up these kings so that the spirit of unrest will come over them. So these kings kind of band together to attack Israel or have war with each other. At this point, we don't know but it's going to talk about having a war with Israel. So these kings come together in a spirit of unrest. It comes over them and they will rouse them. They, meaning those fallen angels, will rouse them, which is those small kings of the east, the Medes and the Persians, Iranians, from their thrones. So that's an idiom for if the king sets down to rest on his throne, he's usually ruling in peace. 
And if he stands up, he stands up to make war is usually the way that goes. Like in Revelation, it says that in those days and then in Daniel 12, Michael stands up. It doesn't necessarily mean he's been sitting all this time, but he takes a stand for the children of Israel. And at that time, it usually means standing up or going to war, something like that, or doing something. So in this case, the spirit of unrest comes over them. Uh, the kings are aroused from their thrones by those fallen angels that they may break forth as lions from their lairs, as hungry as wolves among the flocks. So they are restless, they are angry, they are hungry for, for something, uh, very desirous for a war, and they attack. Okay, So verse 6 says, they will go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones. That, of course, would be Israel. So they seek to attack Israel. And the land of his elect ones will be before them a threshing floor. Now, this threshing floor could be an idiom for the Temple Mount, because remember David, when he took over the area, uh, he, he specifically found the place he wanted to build the temple, and Onan the Jebusite owned it, and David asked to pay for it. Remember the story? And he says, no, no, I'll give it to you. If you want to build a temple here, it's yours. And David said, no, no, I will never, ever give something to the Lord that I just got free from someone else. I will pay fair value for it. And of course, he accepted it. That's a good moral lesson for us. A lot of times we're always looking for handouts and we should always be ready to support ourselves and then be able, as, as the Psalm says, like Psalm 31, to uh, help other people with the excess money. So not to be greedy, but not to be a bum. And that, that is a really cool concept it's perfectly fine if you gave me a car, for instance, and I didn't need one. My family didn't need it, so I donated it to the church. That didn't cost me anything either, but that's a gift that I just bless someone else with. But something dedicated to the Lord, uh, David's attitude is, is remarkable. So that threshing floor of, of um, owning the Jebusite is, is basically the temple mount. Or this could be, they will be like a threshing floor. A threshing floor in general is where you have wheat and chaff and you either beat it, throw it up, win it, whatever, to separate the, the wheat from the chaff so that the, the junk gets blown away, ceases to exist, and you have the good stuff. So it's a way of sorting things out. But the land of his elect ones will be, be before them like a threshing floor and a highway. So they seek to go straight there. But the city of my righteousness, or my righteous, which is Jerusalem, the city, will be a hindrance to their horses, and they will begin to fight among themselves. So this is interesting to me. That whole idea about beginning to fight amongst yourselves is a, a lot like um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog and Magog War, and many other wars. So this could be an overwhelming attack where you've got like 100,000 troops against, you know, five troops. No way you could win unless they get confused and turn on themselves. Uh, and that could happen a hundred different ways. But the Lord causes that kind of a thing. Now, we're to stand up in, for what is righteousness and be, be willing to risk being injured or uh, imprisoned for righteousness sake. But the Lord is in control of everything and can do some amazing things. So in this case, um, they begin to fight amongst themselves. And that's, that's the downfall from them. Their right hand will be strong against themselves. Right hand, when you're talking about Jewish culture, usually means Messiah so, or, or proper religion. So this particular group, this is Elam or in Persia and the kings of the east, that's Islamic. So their religion is their right hand, their concept of God. Um, so their right hand will be strong against themselves. It's because of the religion that causes the problem. And the man will not know his brother, nor the son, his father, or his mother, till there will be no number of their corpses 
through their own slaughter. Again, it sounds a lot like Gog Magog type stuff. Their punishment will not be in vain. In those days, the mouth of Sheol will be open and it will be swallowed up. They will be swallowed, swallowed up in it. Sheol will devour and destroy the sinners in the presence of the elect. So this sounds like God steps in and does something miraculous. Now, I just want to go just a little bit into chapter 57 for a contrast. This talks about, if we studied it, is talking about the Gog Magog War. So Ezekiel 38, 39, Gad chapter 2, Enoch chapter 57, all are about the Gog Magog War, which we'll study later. This says, though, just look at this first one. It shall come to pass after this. I saw another host of men riding on wagons or tanks that sail through the winds of the air, like planes and missiles, coming from the east to the south. And if we go through and read this, it's obviously talking about the Gog and Magog War. And so the point is, after this, uh, there's another war. So that means the war with Iran and Israel is not the Gog Magog War. Now, it's possible that because of this slaughter, Russia immediately comes down and does something. But it's not like Russia enters the war to help Iran and then something happens because that would all be the same war. There's at least a, a bit of time between the two wars. So they're technically different wars. And there may be, you know, years between the two wars. So, but just, just to let us know that it's a different war. So, for instance, when this happens, it's possible that the Psalm 83 war uh, about the 10 terrorist groups in the areas get wiped out. Not the nations, but the terrorist groups. Um, there's there's uh, Isaiah 17 that talks about the destruction of Damascus, Syria. And then there's this war about you know, Iran. It's possible that all those are the same. But... The Gog Magog War is different. And that makes sense to me because I see the Gog Magog War as being, and we've studied this a little bit, but the scrolls seem to indicate a revival of the Roman Empire. And when it's revived the last time, it's actually a Russian Empire, as far as that goes. Um, and that's set to possibly happen. I could be totally off on that. If that's the case, that part hasn't happened yet. And then it has to attack Israel, be completely wiped out by God, because no one else can do that. Then, in a time of um, turmoil, because all governments and, and the empire is gone, 10 nations rise up to take a governmental control. And that's where we get the 10 nations from. And that kind of fits the prophecies of Daniel. Again, I could be wrong on that. But that's just my take. But if that's true, that makes sense that what we're seeing now would not be the Gog Magog War either, because Russia hasn't really formed an empire in that sense uh, to that extent, as prophesied in the Ezra Apocalypse, um, to do this. And this looks like it could be imminent. So, And it's interesting that uh, Enoch would say this happens, and then after this war, after this comes to pass, coming to pass means basically being completely finished. So there's this war. They somehow turn on themselves and they're obliterated. Okay. After all of that takes place, then there is this war involving the Gog Magog group. So two separate wars. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. And I just wanted to kind of show this to you. So this whole concept then, Elam is the coast of Iran, Persia, like Cyrus and Darius and those, well, Cyrus anyway, and the Persians are the other part. So Elam and Persia together is Iran. Biblically, we've got, um, and there, we've got several things that may also talk about this or may have been finished a long time ago, but we have this particular one about in the latter times, the whole thing is finished. And then the prophecy of Enoch in the latter times 
before the Gog Magog invasion, there is a war with the children of Israel and the kings of the east, specifically the Persians, which is Iran. So putting those together, it's kind of an interesting thing. So if this is about to be fulfilled, it may or may not be, uh, it will be eventually, but if this is about to be fulfilled, Iran would step into this war and somehow um, their right hand attacking their left hand to me sounds like a civil uprising. I mean, enough is enough. Let's not all die. Let's all live in peace. And the government gets overthrown and the refugees come back. So we, we're living in exciting times. We could actually be seeing the beginning of the fulfillment of Obadiah with the, the taking of southern Lebanon uh, and the um, taking over of Gaza. Of course, it's happened before, and then the Israelis have turned around and given the land back to other, other places or other governments. So if they take it, it looks like it's fulfilled. And if they turn around and give it back again, it's not fulfilled. So, but somewhere along the line, we recognize that these prophecies will take place. And sometimes when you look at the other scrolls, you get a basic picture. The only thing we're learning from this is if the Iranian-Israeli war is not the Gog-Magog war, but this happens first, just that alone might help us understand a lot of things. We've got two things that were floating over here, who knows where, and now we have a basic order set forth. So if we can do something, <coughs> excuse me, if we can do something like that with even half of the other prophecies, like Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, things like that, uh, we might be able to put together a really clear picture of end time prophecy. So let me stop there for the moment and we'll just go in and we'll look at um, some of the questions. Don't have as many as I thought. Does anyone think we are headed into the Psalm 83 war? Um, definite possibility. The thing about Psalm 83, some interesting things about it. We know that 10 nations arise out of what was the Roman Empire. In Psalm 83, if you count up the, the groups that attack, there's actually 10 of them. So at first thought, it's like, ooh, is this the same thing, you know? But you'll notice it doesn't say that Egypt goes to war with Israel. But there is a group of Hagarenes, which are Egyptians, that goes to war with Israel. So that makes it sound like the government of Israel really doesn't want war, but someone else does. And then there's uh, uh, the Mount Lubel uh, with Lebanon, Lebanon. Lebanon is another example. Lebanon may or may not like Israel, but Lebanon is not seeking war. The government of Lebanon does not want war or won't push war anyway. But there is a terrorist group in their area called Hezbollah that would want to and has many times attacked Israel from the north. So it's not Lebanon that's a problem. It's a group of people in Lebanon. It's not Egypt that's a problem. It's a group of people in Egypt. Now, maybe secretly they're okay with it. Maybe the nation is trying to get rid of it, but they just did. There's no way that they can do that. They're too powerful. However, it is in Psalm 83, you've got 10 groups of terrorists in 10 countries. So the countries aren't necessarily the problem at that point. But the reason why I think it's still a, a future prophecy is that it's uh, it's written by Asaph, Asaph. And Asaph is praying, Lord, please make them like the Jebusites and the Canaanites, the people that surround us, that hurt us. And um, the interesting thing about that is, uh, you know, you might say that, well, if it's end time prophecy in our, our, our age, then it could have been 1948. Because it was, I mean, those were nations and not terrorist groups, but eh, maybe. But the thing is, after that took place, the Lord did not make them like Canaanites and Jebusites. They didn't go away. They reattacked in 67. They still didn't go away. They attacked again in 73, 1973. They still didn't go away. And then there's skirmishes with some of them. 
like the 2006, the Lebanese war and, you know, a little the intifadas and all that kind of stuff. So now if it happens again, uh, it's still never going to be finished or completed until the prayer is answered. The prayer is, Lord, can you basically get rid of our enemies so that we're not attacked every five minutes by who knows who? Just fix the problem so there's no more attacks. That kind of a thing. We, as far as the United States is concerned, of course, we're in between two large oceans. We have never been attacked, per se, uh, in modern times like this. We've entered wars and, and done proxy wars, but we've never... Uh, nobody's ever attacked us from Canada or attacked us military style from Mexico, that kind of a thing. There's been skirmishes, but I mean, no, Russia has never crossed over and attacked us, attacked Alaska or anything like that. So we, we're at relative peace in that sense. But these guys, the nations that surround them are always trying to attack. So Psalm 83, I don't think is finished yet. And this would fit because, again, it's not Lebanon, it's Hezbollah, it's not Egypt, it's, well, it's, what was that down there called? The Muslim Brotherhood, I think, down in Egypt. Don't know if they're still around. It wasn't Syria, it was ISIS. And it wasn't, you know, this group, it was that or whatever. So it's something to look at. I think it's still coming. Now, is this happening? Well, right now, it's just Gaza and possibly Hezbollah, well, Hamas and Hezbollah, not Gaza. I shouldn't say that. The Gazan people are just people. But um, in, in this case, Hamas is the government of Gaza Strip. But Hezbollah is not the government of Lebanon. So we'll see how it goes. But it definitely could be. And all we can do is speculate until after it's over. And this is going to be a horrendous war. Is it biblical? Don't know. We'll find out. Where is modern day Edom? Modern day Edom is um, uh, Jordan. Uh, so when you're in Israel and you cross the Jordan River, there is um, Edom to the south, Ammon in the middle, and then Moab at the top. They're all cousins, basically. Moab and Ammon were the two sons of the two daughters of Lot when they escaped going from Sodom and Gomorrah when it was destroyed. And Moab founded the Moabites, uh, Ammon founded the Ammonites, and then Edom down, was down there where Esau was, those, those group of people. The interesting thing about it is those three countries became what we call Transjordan or Jordan, created a new state. And uh, in the book of Daniel, when it talks about the Antichrist, when he first gets started, He's not able to attack or go forth into uh, Edom, Moab, or Ammon. Well, today those three are one thing. It's, it's Jordan. So it makes it sound like Jordan doesn't get wiped out or anything necessarily. For some reason, it's a problem politically or a power to be reckoned with or something. So when the Antichrist first starts... He's able to pretty much go anywhere, but he can't set foot in there for whatever reason, uh, be it God doing it, political, whatever. And of course, in Jordan, just right inside of Jordan is Petra and Pella and other cities like that, that I think have a very prophetic um, uh, thing that's going to happen in those cities, something in the near future. So modern day Edom is basically southern Jordan. And technically, I mean, the borders shift all the time. It, it could be southern Borden and a, a small piece of Saudi Arabia, depending on the borders. They haven't shifted in quite a while since World War II, but I mean, they do every century or two. Damascus ceases to be a city in Isaiah 17, but the latter... In the same prophecy, verse 4, the glory of Jacob is diminished and he will grow lean. Does this predict an Israel loss when Damascus is destroyed? Uh, it definitely sounds like it. Um, 
if you read it very carefully, it doesn't say that Damascus does something stupid and Israel gets mad and so Israel goes to war with them on purpose. It says that Damascus is there, something happens in a single night and Damascus ceases from being a city. And it's because of what the children of Israel do. Now that could be a war, but the way that it's written, it almost seems like it's, it's their fault because something happened but it may not be an intentional attack. I don't think anybody's thinking like, let's launch some missiles and kill off every single person in that city. It's almost, to me, sounds like they're smuggling in weapons for Hezbollah or something again. This time, a chemical weapon or a tactical nuke or something rather than conventional weapons somehow manages to slip into Damascus. And then Israel goes to blow it up like they do the other stuff and it causes disaster. It sounds like it's something like that. Something similar happened in, I want to say, was it Beirut? I want to say that like a few years ago. They had an incredible amount of um, explosives on the dock. Now, you guys will probably remember this. And something happened. I don't, nobody knows for sure if it was Israel or what, but something happened to blow it up. If it was arms coming in, that probably would be Israel. But whatever it was, there was so much explosives in that thing that when it went off, I think it destroyed like 13 city blocks or something like that. Some a huge amount. And the, most of the people in the government just resigned at, at that point. But it's interesting to see what happens. So, yeah, the whole idea is the glory of Jacob is diminished. That could just be in the eyes of the world, the glory. Uh, and he will grow lean. It, it definitely shows there's some sort of a backlash or problem. If there is a chemical or nuclear reaction, a bomb or something that goes off in Damascus, uh, I guess it depends on the wind flow and everything, but it is possible that the chemical or radiation or whatever could leak into northern Israel. So it could be a lot of different things. But yeah, they're not going to come out of this unscathed. Maybe Shiite and Sunni warning at one time again. Brother against brother, they hate that poison code as much as Israel. Um, yeah, and that's that's an excellent example. Uh, Islam probably could have captured the world if they were all together as one. But the Shia and the Sunni being like arch enemies type thing, uh, it's amazing. I think it's it, it, it's referred to in one of the prophets as a perpetual hatred uh, against Israel mainly. But it's interesting in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um basically having being mad is, is what it says that they all of Israel was walking in madness so this whole concept and if you think about this kind of pull it together this is the Jewish nation 2,000 years ago you got Pharisees that want to kill Sadducees because they're not keeping the law right true they were not but anyway you've got Sadducees then that want to kill Pharisees because they're not keeping the law right as far as what they think so it's amazing at this point, you've got one hand divided, and maybe that was something God had intended to keep the Essenes safe, but they go to war with each other and almost wipe each other out. It got so bad, if you remember the civil war in 80 to 90 BC between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they killed off so much of their own kind of each other that they both petitioned Rome to step in and to restore order, and Rome did. So Rome was never, never actually invaded to conquer them. Both parties claimed to be the proper Israeli government and begged Rome to step in. And that's what started everything because they had lost the ability to govern. You don't kill somebody because they're another religion than you or because they're trying to contact the spirits of the dead or, or whatever. Those are things that are technically... According to the law of Moses, they're technically death penalty, but God takes care of that. We don't pass judgment on that. We would banish you, but you know, not allow it here. But you don't kill for those things. That's why Peter and John were beaten and let go. They would have loved to have killed them, but it's illegal. 
because they're preaching Jesus, which they consider to be a cult or a, another religion. So whoop them and send them out. That's the best we can do, according to the law. So again, it's it's interesting. So now you've got Shia and Sunni warring against each other. And there's several other factions. Uh, the ruling class in Syria is Alawite, which is very interesting, I think, compared to some of the other prophecies. But yeah, constantly trying to kill each other back and forth. And some of the differences from my understanding, I could be wrong, but some of the differences, the way I was taught, is that Shia and Sunni basically believe the exact same thing. But on a practical level, the Sunnis are waiting for the Messiah to come, wipe out Christians in Israel and fix everything. They're waiting on the Messiah. Christians and Jews, likewise, are waiting on the Messiah to come and fix everything. Whether he wipes them out or forgives them or whatever, he, he, whatever he does, he fixes it. The difference is that the Shia have this concept that they have to create chaos or destroy something or do something. They have to set up a certain situation before the Messiah will come. So it's a, it's a total different concept. I believe Jesus will come and fix stuff. I'm not going to try to become a government and fix stuff. I don't want to kill people. That's what a government should do. But that's, that's not what I'm designed for. If I all of a sudden did decide I need to form a militia, take over the government, kill off everybody, whether I'm successful or not, that's kind of the concept. It's, it's a, it would become a cultic, kind of like the Ku Klux Klan type thing. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we'd want to stay away from. And you could see while in the United States, you've got constitutional patriots, of which I'm one, and you would have a cultic group like that, there could be a bloodbath. And so that's the kind of thing you're, you're talking about. I think the, the, the answer to this whole thing, which is not going to happen, but the answer to this whole thing, whether you're Muslim, Jewish, Christian, whatever, on the Muslim side, just abandon the concept of, Shia, of Sharia law. Okay, The nation of Israel is Jewish to the core. I mean, hardcore rabbinic rabbi type stuff. And they have the law of Moses. The government does not follow the law of Moses. It is a republic or a democratic type system. Okay. We're mainly Christian over here. And I don't know about a Christian law type stuff, but we have a constitution. We're a constitutional republic. Spain is Roman Catholic mainly. Uh, they have whatever they have. I don't know, but they have Spanish law. I'm sure it's different in places than ours, similar in others. So it's the same kind of a thing. So if you would divorce the governmental system from the religion, it would actually fix a lot of the hatred problems. You're not supposed to go try to kill off the enemy. And the enemy is not, is not someone that doesn't follow a 7th century coat of arms. And that's the problem. In Sharia law, you have female genital mutilation. You have slavery. You have uh, uh, infidel tax. You have uh, the, the uh, property concept of lying. Uh, you, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that, but those are just some of the bigger ones. Get rid of those, and then we can talk to people. So anyway, um, yes, Shia and Sunni is probably, those are the two biggest branches of Islam, actually. What do you know about what some are claiming that some Palestinians could be the Israelites left in Palestine uh, to, to do the farming and maybe concerts to Muslims. I hadn't really heard of anything like that. Uh, Bill Salas teaches that the Palestinians are the what's left over from the people that came up from Edom, so the ancient Esauites, so to speak. Uh, Arab nations, you know, but from that branch of the family. Um, other people I've heard Palestinians are, you know, basically a little bit of everything. There was one Saudi Arabia prince this week that was saying, surprisingly, he was pro-Israel, not pro-Palestinian. He was saying, hey, this is a family skirmish or war. Um, and Israel, even though we don't like them because they're not Muslim, 
their brothers, their, their sons of Isaac, uh, grandson of, you know, or son of Abraham, and we're through Ishmael. So we're actually brothers. And he was trying to say the Palestinians are people left over from the Romans and the Mongols and the Greeks and this and that and the other thing, and they have nothing to do with us. So go somewhere. This is a family feud, so, so to speak. I thought that was really interesting to have uh, someone say that from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think Amir had posted that. And Amir is a good, uh, Amir Safardi is a, he's got a channel on Telegram. Telegram is about the one place you can go to actually get uh, free news, uh, unbiased, won't be shut down, that kind of thing. So always do that with a, uh, look at that with a, a careful lens, because that also means someone could be lying to you. You know, so before Amir comes and catches it, there might be something fake in there, but at least he's not going to be shut down. So the concept in America of freedom of speech is to know that half the people are going to be lying or confused. So you don't believe everything you hear. But if anybody has the power to shut anybody down, if the person that has that power becomes evil, and that can happen as a, to a person or a government or anybody, then you have total chaos or a war situation. And that's why we have freedom of speech. So just to let you know. Um, let's see here. Isn't Iran involved via the proxies Hamas and Hezbollah? Yeah, they fund uh, the, um, according to Israel, they um, send the um, uh, arms constantly. And that's why Israel is always bombing, not Syria proper, uh, not the people or even the Syrian army, but certain airports. Because you, there's only so many ways you could qu fairly quickly fly and you can see all this from the, the satellites, but Iran flies something into here, and it gets reloaded, it flies into here, then it gets to this base, to that base, and then eventually would go to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And they've seen this time after time after time. And so a lot of times they will blow up the depots of weapons, or like in this case, they don't want to spend time hunting and searching for the weapons per se. If you just destroy the, not even the airport, but the runways, just drop a little bomb, not a little bomb, but one bomb, tear up a one runway, you can't land or take off. So nobody gets hurt. It's just stopped. They repair it. That's fine. They're watched. And if they start to ship arms to the enemy again, and that's what anybody would do in any war situation. You stop the supplies. And if someone says, I'm ar arming the enemy, then you have entered the war so you are a target so yeah they've done that for quite a while or at least off and on that's what the israelis say anyway so i'm just saying uh could this be a force shattering of zechariah 14 the houses rifled and their women ravished uh very well could be that's another prophecy that we would need to look at and that again talks about in the latter times so that's one that's probably in our lifetime Um, question, in your opinion, what prophecy most closely fits what we are currently seeing? Um, probably, biblically, I would say Obadiah. And we talked about that, I think, last, well, not last week. I think it was Saturday. I did a small clip on the Obadiah prophecy. It's called uh, Lebanon and Bible Prophecy. But basically, the concept is, according to that, they come back the second time, which would be 1948, and it shows how the the native population at that point pick up, move away from the Israelis that come in, and they form Gaza, West Bank, and some of them go to southern Jordan, which actually happened. So that part was fulfilled. And then it talks about later on what happens is that the Israelites take the entire coast of the Canaanites, which would include the Philistines, which would include Gath, which is Gaza. And it goes all the way up to a place called Seraphon, Lebanon, which is ancient Zarephath in Lebanon, where Elijah raised the widow's son. So if that takes place, then that means they keep and hold southern Lebanon. And I have said for the longest time, 
when you rain rockets down on me that just go randomly and hit dirt, maybe once in a great while, a bullet hits a, 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 bo a boulder or a, sh or a um, bus or something like that, you can kind of wink at that because of politics. Just leave it alone. But when you get missiles with guidance system and everyone hits the bus of kids or hits a house or a target, you can't let 4,000 rockets rain down at the, the majority hit their targets. You've got to stop that. And you can't stop it and let them reload and stop it and let them reload. Eventually, you have to stop it permanently. What I noticed earlier today, Iran had made the, or not Iran, um, the government of Lebanon had made the comment that they have no control over Hezbollah. So they're, you know, they don't want to enter the war or whatever, trying to not get attacked, I imagine. Um, but it's the same thing. Okay, it's your country. You control the terrorist group in your country. If you can't do that, someone will have to do it for you. And if I give you the, the, the take it over and then turn around and give you the land back, which they've done twice now, I think, um, and then you let it happen again or can't stop it. Let's just assume they're nice people and they're telling the truth and they just can't control it. Then someone needs to control it for them on a permanent basis. And so that's where that prophecy is going to take place. I think we're beginning to see the beginning of that. Now, again, if all that happens and Israel turns around and gives the land back yet again, then we're just going to have to go through the whole process again, because Obadiah is pretty specific. Um, I believe in my spirit that the IDF will reign, regain Gaza, the West Bank, possibly Lebanon before this war is over. We'll see what happens. Um, there is a prophecy about the Antichrist when he comes on the scene, and that's not now. That's later on in time. But it seems to indicate that there is a place where he has his international headquarters. And then after a time, he invades Israel. So the international headquarters is not in, not in Israel. It's somewhere else. And then another prophecy seems to indicate, I could be wrong, but seems to indicate the area is the same area where a king was that attacked. Long story short, it's in today what's called the West Bank. So if the West Bank is ever, what I've always thought is that Gaza and southern Lebanon become Israeli territory, and so does uh, Gilead, according to Obadiah's prophecy. But then it seems like the West Bank, it may change borders a little bit, but begins to be recognized uh, as a sovereign nation. And that would allow the Antichrist to be able to do that. So um, it would be interesting to see. So from Obadiah, and a little bit in Zephaniah and others, but Obadiah mainly we see the, and it's just one chapter. It's like 19 verses long. So the last part is pretty interesting. But it seems like the tip of Jordan, which is Gilead, southern Lebanon, Gaza Strip, become Israeli territory. Uh, and one day they will stop giving it back to stop this problem from happening. So, yeah, we're going to, I, I have that feeling, too, that we're going to see some possibly good stuff in here. Um, prophecy being fulfilled, rather. Uh, how does this fit with the shepherd's prophecy? The shepherd's prophecy is a prophecy about a war in the Golan Heights area. It's ancient Bashan. It's where Og, the king of the Bashanites, the, the giant, lived. And the basic war is that, or basic prophecy is that there's going to be eight wars between a revived Israel after the second coming of Israel, the second return, the 1948 event, and the second return of the Messiah. So in this time period, and that would be the last three generations, basically, of time, so from 1948 forward, somewhere in this time period, there's going to be eight wars. And these wars are fought between Syria and Israel over a stretch of land in the middle or this the place. And that's ancient Bashan. If you if you memorize the current uh, countries in their old names, then you will you will you will see this stuff pretty easy. There's several prophecies about Bashan and that's Golan Heights. Egypt's easy. Egypt's just Egypt. So I don't know why that's different, but. Javan is Greece, for instance, and things like that. So 
Elam and Persia is Iran, Magog is southern Russia, things like that. So it's it's pretty interesting. We've got a lot of details if you accept the old texts. Uh, they're pretty specific. So the shepherd's prophecy, right now, there's nothing going on with it. But if Syria entered the war, and if you just got to wait till the war is over. When the war is over, if they give up or take more territory in the area of Bashan, Golan Heights, then that would make Netanyahu finally a shepherd, or not a shepherd, but a principal leader. And that would be the, the next phase of that set of prophecies. So far, we've had four. It's 1948, 1967, 1973, and then 1982. It wasn't so much a war, but they changed the borders and took more territory in the Golan Heights. So very interesting stuff happening. Is there anything in prophecy referring to Israel losing any good uh, many of military personnel, which seems to be what happened when Hamas took them by surprise. Um, there's a few places like the one that we'd mentioned, someone had mentioned before about uh, uh, when uh, Damascus is destroyed. It mentions that uh, the glory is diminished and um, I forget what it says, but it, it, it describes a series of cities that have taken very, very bad hits some in Israel and some in other places. So whatever happens that causes Damascus to cease from being a city, it's pretty interesting because it, it affects, nobody gets out of it unscathed over there in that area. So there, there very well could be others like that too. In your opinion, wouldn't you think all these wars have to happen close together due to the size of Israel's military and the enormous size of the armies? and the terrorists coming against Israel. I would think so. I, I wouldn't have thought that it would have taken all the wars that have happened already. You know, like the 48, 67, 73, the, the skirmishes in the 80s, 90s, two, 2000s, 2006, the Lebanese war, and then the other one. And then all the, you know, all the intifadas and all that stuff is kind of small, but these are some major wars. I wouldn't have think thought it would take that long, except that it's, you know, mentioned in uh, the shepherd's prophecy in Micah 5. But yeah, it would make sense, at least some of them. So if we're reading Enoch right, the Gog-Magog war is a totally separate thing than the war with Iran. And then the war with Iran may or may not include Obadiah's prophecy of Hezbollah and Hamas. So I would I would think a vast majority are in there. As far as Damascus getting destroyed, I don't know which one that would be in. Seems like it would be with this one, but it could be something separate. All we really know for sure is there's a series of prophecies. We don't know the timing. Of, it's like when people try to argue about the timing of the rapture, try to set a date. None of these prophecies have dates. There's just, well, three or four that I know of had an actual date set. And they've, they, I think they've all been fulfilled. So the rest of them is just sometime there will be this incident and it sparks this series of stuff. How many leaders of Israel will there be till Enoch's prophecy is fulfilled? Um, it doesn't mention leaders particular. Oh, Enoch's prophecy. Uh, there's supposed to be 58 total or 58 turns, something like that. Um, I think it's in chapter 89 and 90. So I think we have a, a video on it on our YouTube channel. Uh, we should redo those because when we did the book of Enoch, that was a good six, seven years ago or better. And so a lot's happened in the last six or seven years. People have been asking us to redo ancient prophecies revealed and redo Enoch and those things. And we are uh, planning on that. Updates anyway. In Israeli history, after uh, warring within the land, they are usually seize and take the land. Especially like the accord to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis. Afterwards, why have they not done this 667, 73 West Bank? Um, I think it's mainly just political pressure. Uh, give back the land, that kind of a thing. And again, if it was a normal war, that would be fine. I mean, Germany has been great ever since World War II. 
so there are evil governments and the governments oh, in the major wars they always go in and replace the government so they replaced japan's government replaced the government in um in turkey replaced the government in in egypt and all those kind of things so and that's what the law of moses says to do too but they're not actually following the law of moses either so it's a good question eventually they're going to get back to this um when Netanyahu was um, uh, right before he was ousted the last time, there was some sort of skirmish going on, I think maybe with Gaza, I'm not sure. But he made the comment about um, um, uh, re-elect me and I will start following the, that particular part of the law of Moses. You attack me from that place, that place is now our territory. You know, so the buffer zone is on your side. You, it comes from a time when bows and arrows and troops could only go so far. And so if you can attack me from here, I'm taking your part of the country and making that a buffer zone. So now you're twice as far away from me for to make my people safe. So you, the loser always gives up territory. So uh, it sounds like they're going to start doing that. If, if we're reading the prophecies right, they definitely will. Whether that's now or not, we don't know for sure. Besides Russia, could the USA or Western powers in general be re regenerated Roman power after the Herpazo rapture removes the church from the USA and Western powers? Um, I suppose that's a possibility. The one thing we would know is if the rapture happened right now, then there'll be a revival, but at least for a few days anyway, the only people left in all the governments of the world will be non-Christians. So that's going to make a major change almost immediately. Everybody's going to fall to the Antichrist concept and uh, go forward. So, yeah, we're not immune from it. Right now, we kind of are because there's too many Christians all over. Could Hosea 5.1 be happening right now? Let me look that up real quick. I think that's the last question we have. But Hosea 5.1, usually pretty good at this. But uh, Mitzvah and Tabor said 5.1. Yeah. Don't know for sure. It very well could be. Uh like I say, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and we'll have to wait till the war is over to see exactly what happened. And even if it does happen according to prophecy, the question would be, will they turn around and give the land back? A lot of us thought that Obadiah, the Obadiah prophecy about taking and holding southern Lebanon was fulfilled in 2006, because it sure looked like it would. But they gave the land back, and now they're having to do it again. So eventually it's a permanent deal so it'll happen sometime so okay um uh, that's about all we have time for now i will continue to try to give little updates little things little videos we'll throw out there throughout the week uh on what's going on especially if something interesting happens next monday we'll be back and probably continue some of these studies on the the prophecies so so far since the war has started We've put out a video on Hamas prophecies and a small video on the prophecy of Lebanon and Bible prophecy uh, from Obadiah. And then this one about Enoch and Jeremiah 49 talking about the Iranian prophecy. So we'll continue to watch and pull these out and see what it actually says and if it might be being fulfilled. And if it's not this time, it will be next time for sure because time is, is getting short. But really interesting to see this stuff happening we do need to pray though for all the innocent people that are being affected and this is one good example of why if you lived in gaza if you could probably most of them couldn't but if you could move out of there do so okay and they probably can't because it all depends on politics but so for instance people talk about you know missionary work maybe you want to go to damascus syria to try to do missionary work if the lord tells you to do it do it but understand that city is going to be obliterated inside of a single night 
and the longer we wait the closer that day comes or is coming so if you live in damascus syria and you can go somewhere else move because the prophecies will be specific so it's the same thing with the iranians i can see some of them leaving uh, if they can or could have back in the day um some of them did like my friend that left iran his father left took him with him and they went to turkey for safety so anyway uh, a good example of that we need to treat the scriptures and the prophecies as being literal and try to make sure that we and our families are in a, in a safe place and try to explain these to people even if we're looked at as being a nut because when it takes place, people are going to come back and ask you, how did you know? And you can explain it by saying, the reason I know is these prophecies in the Bible. And these prophecies prove the Bible is supernatural. And the supernatural Bible tells us we're all destined for hell unless we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. So it's a proof text of this. And we want people saved. We don't want anyone going to hell. We want people saved. So I'll go ahead and stop there for tonight, and we will see you next week. God bless.